Hi. Every year about this time, right before Halloween, I do a, an excursion to the spirit store. And part of my going to the spirit store is to do research. And I research to see what kinds of costumes are out there that are aligned with my understanding of and research uh, and study of cultural appropriation. And I'm rarely disappointed. There is always a new uh, dreadlock wig that somebody will inevitably wear who does not have locks. Uh, sometimes I find um, you know, indigenous mascots, although since George Floyd's murder, we've become a little more conscious of that. And it all helps me to sort of show to my students and in the community presentations I do what cultural appropriation is and how it manifests itself. In its most simplest terms, for me, cultural appropriation is stealing from a subordinate culture and not giving that culture credit or compensation. And that can take so, so many forms. And, you know, it's not as complicated as people think it is when you start talking about the difference between appropriation and appreciation. Appropriation is definitely about power. Those who are in charge and making the decisions and those who are not. Appreciation is way, way um, disconnected from any association of power. When I'm talking about stealing, I'm talking about language, I'm talking about costumes, I'm talking about music, I'm talking about clothing. I'm talking about the ways in which another person's identity becomes a performance for some folks. And that is not just a black and white thing. Uh, it is not just white people who are stealing from black and brown people. Black and brown people can appropriate and do appropriate too. So I hope to participate in a conversation <clears throat> that is not reductive, but rather a conversation that allows us to look at the humanity that is denied people when their identities are stolen and they are not compensated for that. It is reducing a very complex and complicated culture for the sake of laughing or mocking or stereotyping or caricaturing. So I would be very excited to participate in a conversation that is not necessarily a debate because this is not something that people will be arrested for doing, uh, but it is something that can have social consequences for those who are unaware. And as I've said in my teaching for the past 30 years, once we know, we can't unknow, but we can certainly ignore. So thank you very much for considering me. I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, hi. Hi, how's it going? Okay, good. good. Thank you for accommodating me. Of course, yeah, absolutely. That's the least I can do. Um, okay, all right. So, yeah, as I was saying, uh, so I have uh, some questions that are prepared by Dr. Phil and some of the other executives. These are, you know, these are probably going to be more questions than you're ever going to need to answer on the show itself, but it's our way to kind of get all of the topics that we hope to discuss in some manner, um, either through you or one of our other guests. Um, we like to just ask each guest their points on it, and if you have any, like, good points in this interview, then we may be like, oh, okay, well, we're going to have Neil touch on this in this segment, um, because he had a really good point about this, and, okay. and so on and so forth. So all right. It's our way of just, like, hedging our bets and getting a good understanding of how you're going to help our show, you know, be the best thing so, okay. Um, so yeah, I got I got those questions here. I'm just gonna dive right in. Um, yeah, let me just answer them the best you can. You know, keep it kind of concise, but you know, feel free to extrapolate any way you you know see necessary. I saw that you've done stuff like this before, so this shouldn't be yes know, too too par for the course. This should be par for the course, rather. So okay, okay. So for the, first and foremost, can, uh, do I have your permission to record this call? Sure. So I can send it in. Sure. Okay, cool. I'm going to do that now. This call is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please disconnect at this time. Okay. Sounds good. So the lady lady talks. That means we're recording. Okay, great. Um, all right. So first question is, uh, cultural appropriation is defined as the uh, unacknowledged or inappropriate adoption of the customs, practices, ideas, art forms, etc. of one people or society by members of another and typically more dominant people or society. So can you talk to me about what that means, what cultural appropriation means to you in terms of American society? 
Uh, well, I want to specify, first of all, it's not American society. It's U.S. society uh, because there are lots of Americas. <clears throat> so we have to be very specific when we're talking about history uh, because the history of the USA is not necessarily the history of Latin America or South America. So if we're talking about in the, in the, in the United States, <clears throat> and I know cultural appropriation isn't restricted to domestic uh, causes, but it's about the history that's also associated with power. And the groups that are what we call mainstream or those in positions of power uh, can always steal from, take from those who have no resources to defend themselves or no historical authority. So for me, cultural appropriation is about power and histories and not necessarily just power alone. Well, I, I, you know, and that's what you, it, it's not really well, you, a, you say that like white people and white culture can't be appropriated. Um, that's been a huge topic of discussion around this show is what cultures can and can't. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, but I think we have to sort of talk about first of all, what culture is and I, what I hope that I bring to the show is that we don't just restrict this to black and white because there are ways in which culture is much bigger than that. Culture is not just about race. So the answer to your question is, um, which is not an opinion, is that you can just look at the data and the research that shows that positions of power are mostly held by white men. And it's not white uh, transgender men. It's not white uh, men who are poor. Uh, it is about white men. And so for me, a conversation about, about cultural appropriation has to be intersectional. So we can say, yes, we live in a culture in this country, a society where the people who are making decisions are white men. And we can validate that by looking at the September 2020 New York Times piece, which says 80% of the power in this country is still held by white people, even though we're more a diverse country. So it's not about numbers. It's about people who are in positions of power who are making decisions about other people. So when I talk about this, I hope that the conversation about cultural appropriation is not about black and white, that is really about something that's more intersectional. It's about age. It's about language. Uh, and those things aren't necessarily black and white. It's about gender. You know, when, when men are imitating women, for example, for the sake of laughed, that is cultural appropriation also. You know, how, how, often, how do you see cultural appropriation permeating in society most often? You, you just gave a few really excellent points. But well, it's everywhere. Others? It's everywhere. It's from the language. You know, old people appropriate from young people when we try to use hip language or corporate America uh, steals hip hop language for the sake of ads and for commercial reasons. Um, you know, local high school students will have a senior day and for their senior day, they'll dress up like old people and they'll get canes and, and walkers and big gray wigs. At Halloween, we get afros if it's got to be a 60s theme and please, please, please don't go down the route of blackface so how we dress if we decide that we want to put a bendy on because it looks cool versus understanding what that bendy means for those who uh, are culturally aware of that and whose identity is part of that so it's everywhere but I also think of this in terms of language and music I've been seeing a lot of TikTok examples of um, and I'll say in this case, Asian groups that have appropriated black gospel. And what's interesting to me is that these groups get lots and lots of social media attention, but yet the attention is gotten because they're great imitators of black gospel folks. And that's what uh, cultural appropriation is also, is imitation, whereas the imitation seems to get credit for the creative part when, in fact, it was the original that created it. And we know that from music of, of Little Richard to, to Pat Boone, you know, Pat Boone got a whole lot of credit for songs or even Elvis Presley. You know, we're just discovering now that Elvis's whole style came from a black person that he observed and imitated. But yet that was acceptable to mainstream white America. You know, somebody who was black would not be as acceptable. So to go back to your question, yes, I think we still live in a society where whiteness 
is still perceived as the dominant culture and that whatever is white is somehow universal versus something that is not white, which is niche or, you know, ethnic. Mm, yeah. And uh, why does cultural appropriation matter in your own words? Well, it matters because it's about stealing from people and not giving them credit. It would be the same thing that matters if, if, if a friend copied your homework assignment and they got credit for it, but you didn't because you did all the work. That's why it's important. And it also lays bare the ways in which power still manifests itself in these various systems that keep some people on the top and some people on the bottom. Yeah. And, you know, why is it harmful? I know you just kind of answered it there, but are there some other ways, uh, more generally, that cultural appropriating harms people? Well, if you're if it, cultural appropriation means that um, what is yours is not um, is not being compensated for. So let's let's use the example of TikTok and the ways in which these young black women created a whole bunch of TikTok dances and challenges, but yet a white woman went on, you know, Jimmy Kimmel or one of those late night shows, Jimmy Fallon, one of those and got credit for it. Well, she was also getting money for those TikTok performances, but yet the black girls who created that were not. So it is not just um, something that is abstract. It can also translate to dollars. If Kendall Jenner, for example, is creating a kind of uh, tequila and people are buying it and thinking they're buying it because of her versus the people from whom she is sort of stealing that brand or that recipe, then that translates to dollars. We can say the same thing with Jack Daniels, for example. Jack Daniels historically was created by an enslaved person, but that enslaved person never got the benefits or the royalties or the financial gain that um, his owners got. And they took credit for his creation. That's how it's a problem. It shows the manifestations of what power can be when power and history are wed together. Right. And, uh, you know, what are some ways people can be mindful of not appropriating one's culture? You know, do you think it happens unintentionally or do you think it is a conscious thing for some? And how often are people nefarious in how they appropriate said culture and well, that depends on cases because <clears throat> I'm a friend. I'm a, a fan of Judge Judy, so I can't tell what people's intentions are. Uh, what I can say is what the impact of what they've done is, and what I know is that it's not an either or. I think it can be a combination of those. Let's say we're going to a Halloween party and we want to be edgy, so we're going to be in blackface and we're going to wear a dreadlock wig. Uh, if somebody is wearing, for example, something like I have, which is a shirt that I like <clears throat> that has two designs going down the front. I like the shirt. I find out that it's a Mexican wedding shirt. I'm hesitant about wearing that just because now I know about it. Once I know about it, I have to think about it. And if I choose to wear it, at least I'm aware that I could be appropriating another culture. Now, the question is, do I want to be more respectful of that culture? or Do I want to be, you know, thinking myself cute because I'm wearing a, a shirt that I think is cool? And that's what happens in cultural appropriation. So much of cultural appropriation is about being cool, being edgy. Um, it's, it's getting laughs. It's getting attention. It's because it is so different from what one expects. And here's another example. There is an, an elderly, and this is how it's described, elderly white choir from Augusta, Georgia, that is doing hip hop. And they take Nelly's song, for example, It's Getting Hot in Here, where he says, so take off all your clothes or something to that effect. Well, they say we're going to take off all our robes. And it's funny. It's funny because it's incongruous. It's like old white people embracing hip hop, but for the sake of laughing, not because they understand this. In fact, it almost seems like they're mocking. So that to me is part of the danger of cultural appropriation is that it perpetuates stereotypes. It perpetuates the potential of mocking and it keeps people in places of subservience so that we are not looking at people's humanity. And we're also not understanding the fact that this is taking, it's taking up space where somebody who created whatever that was could be benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, is there a difference between 
cultural appreciation and appropriation. Can you t- talk about that difference? Yeah, well, I can. You know, I can. I, people seem to confuse the two. Sorry, well, ahead. I don't. I don't know that people are confused. You know, I do work on the N word, and I have very few people who are confused, especially white people. Everybody I know from high school on and middle school and low know that that's a bad word. But there's this alleged confusion, which to me translates to I disagree with that. So here's an example: uh, Iggy Azalea takes on a black scent when she's doing her rap. Iggy Azalea doesn't sound like that when she talks. And in fact, on, again, either Jimmy, probably Jimmy uh, Kimmel, she was on there and she was translating one of her songs for him. And she was using her Australian accent, which is not the accent that she sings in. So it is a performance for her. And she is taking up space that some black rapper could be taking up and benefiting from. But yet she is in that space. So I don't know that we can go into people's heads and determine what their intentions are. What we can say is, here's the impact of what you've done. Right. And, uh, yeah, what is, you know, can you speak to the difference between the, those two terms? Yeah. Those are kind of the most popular terms today. You know, what are some clear differences? Well, appreciation doesn't mean that you perform it. Uh, you know, I can, I, can, I can appreciate Whitney Houston without trying to sound like Whitney Houston and then being getting kudos for sounding like Whitney Houston. Or in the case of Tokyo Soul, who seems to have created a whole identity around singing black gospel music, imitating black gospel singers, you can appreciate it by listening to it. You can support those who are creating that without necessarily having to perform it so that the performance itself becomes the thing rather than the culture. I mean, there's a whole movement uh, that's been around for years called my, my, uh, my, uh, my culture is not a costume. So dressing up as though this is something that you play with. I mean, I, I go to a lot of thrift stores. I go to spirit stores looking at costumes to see which fall under cultural appropriation. You don't have to dress up in prison attire, for example, when people are incarcerated and certainly don't look at that lightly. So I hope this conversation is not just about black and white, that this conversation is about cultural appropriation in many different areas and directions, whether it is about old people or people who are incarcerated. You can appreciate the music. And and I don't want to get into food because that's a real odd one. But I do know, for example, if on Cinco de Mayo, you decide that you need to wear a sombrero and a, um, you know, some other whatever you deem Mexican attire, that is problematic because you have no understanding of the culture. All you're doing is dressing up for it and partying. And, and we can't forget fashion either, because fashion is also one of those appropriative things. We've seen blackface on runways. We've seen hair is an area where cultural appropriation is really important. Uh, and, and we know we have to know the histories of, of appropriation in hair. Here's an example. You know, when, when people go on cruises, particularly white people going on cruises, they decide they want to stop on an island and have their hair cornrowed and braided because it's cool. Well, we know historically it's not cool when black people are still to this day discriminated against because of their quote unquote natural hairstyles, whether it's dreadlocks or cornrows or any other Afrocentric style. You know, and I I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with with having these conversations and, you know, who, who has the right to call others out? Like, how do you know where the line is and, you know, who, who decides to, or who should decide? Sorry. Um, well, you know, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to shoulds. Um, you know, we should be nicer to everybody, but we're not. We should not speed, but we do. So I personally don't invest a lot of energy in who should and who shouldn't. I think that depends on people's own awareness. I think if people become self-aware, then they are more you know, sensitive to other cultures. I think we have to educate ourselves. I think it's like being an ally when you see something that is unjust. Uh, then you call it out or you call it in, whichever you feel comfortable. But I don't know that they're necessarily police people who devote their lives to policing what other people are doing. You know, one of the things I want to make clear is that cultural appropriation is not a crime any more than saying the N-word is a crime, but there are often social consequences. And if you want your name to be, you know, fodder for Twitter, then you pay attention to what's happening. 
and you pay attention that if you stepped in poop, then you clean it off and try to do better and recognize what people's motives. We never know what people's motives. That's why I resist this notion of what people's intentions are. I don't know what people's intentions are. Uh, you know, somebody walks by me trying to get off the plane and they step on my toe. Well, they didn't mean to step on my toe, I don't think, but I don't know. My toe isn't less hurting because they didn't mean to step on it. So I don't invest a lot of energy and intentions, particularly when we're not talking about a court of law. Yeah, um, at one point you said that like we belong to multiple cultures at the same time because we all have these you know overlapping identities. Um, how can we exercise our need to celebrate our culture without causing harm or being disrespectful? Well, I think part of it is that you fall into spaces where you will do that, but you also have to realize that you know part of being human is also learning from our mistakes and using those mistakes as data. So I certainly don't think that we can predict what people will be doing. I think what we can do is call out the stuff that has been done. So example, if somebody shows up in blackface, that should be called out. You should not be showing up in a public space, particularly as a public figure, which we have seen in blackface, taking pictures and posting it on social media or appropriating a costume, you know, as uh, um, Justin Trudeau, the prime minister Trudeau did when he went to India and dressed up and thought that that was the thing to do. Um, there are ways in which cultures can invite you into the space, but that's a very temporal moment. It doesn't mean that you necessarily go out into that space with that costume on because that's what it becomes. So I think being more mindful of this, but I think since George Floyd's murder, people should have been more cognizant of uh, racial and cultural insensitivities and not just in terms of black and white, but also in terms of indigenous folks. You know, when we started changing the names of, of that uh, football team over in Washington, that's another cultural appropriation. When you take somebody's identity and you make it a mascot, so it's really bigger yeah. than black and white. So I hope the conversation moves beyond whether black people do it and white people. And by the way, black people can do it also. Beyonce has appropriated many times with her, um, you know, Orientalism. Uh, Selena Gomez has appropriated. Black men appropriate when they're dressing up as women, whether it's Flip Wilson or Patrick Swayze. And I'm not talking about the art of drag, which comes from RuPaul and others. There's an art form there. There's nothing when Jamie Foxx does it. Uh, there's nothing when Jimmy Carey, when Jim Carrey does it, except for the sake of laugh. And it's making fun of somebody. And we can still say in this culture, men are still at the top and women are below them in positions of power, economically, decision making, leaders of organizations, etc. So this is not just a black and white race issue. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what do you think is the best response to someone who has appropriated uh, someone else's culture? You know, is there any method to salvation from these people that well acknowledge you know, on? acknowledge that you've done it and that you've made a mistake, but it wouldn't be any different from any other mistake that we make. I'm sorry I did it. I will not do it again. Right. Well, there, I mean, there's or compensate folks <laughs> or compensate folks. You know, if you're taking something, if you're taking something, compensate the people who are um, who are you're, from whom you're taking it from. Buy it, pay them, because you're getting money from it. And this is different from, you know, sampling. You know, cultural appropriation is also like plagiarism. But I know in the music world, that's very complicated. That's very complicated uh, when people are trying to, you know, when they say that they've been inspired by or they've been, uh, they're sampling. And I think there are legal uh, parameters for that kind of conversation. But what I'm talking about is everyday ways. We're not talking about legal ways of stealing. Right, yeah. But once yeah. you've made a mistake, then you should acknowledge that and not be defensive in trying to defend it. Because that's what often happens is the fragility kicks in and then people start, well, I didn't mean to do this. Well, it goes back to my intentions. I don't know if you meant to do it or not. All I know is that this is what happened and this is how I'm receiving it. So once we've, once we've stepped into the poop, clean it off and then try not to step in another pile of poop. And then surround yeah. ourselves with people who are different. 
You know, we, we, we know now from the research that we are often siloed and we surround ourselves with people who look like us, who think like us, whose values are the same as ours. And the only way that we can learn is to, first of all, self-educate, do some reading, Google some things, uh, talk to people, but also talk to people who seem to be strangers. That's how we learn. That's, so diversity really does help us be better uh, and to recognize that we all have sort of short-sightedness until things are, are pointed out. But if we can learn from that, then we have gotten data and it's not really a mistake or a failure. And ask for forgiveness. You know, that's a sign of humanity too, is ask for forgiveness. Um, you know, speaking to that point of like diversity, would you say is there any argument that would support you know appropriation or or call it adaption or borrowing, you know, incorporating from other cultures and ethnicities to avoid cultures becoming too homogenous? Um, or is that the point? Should they? What, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know what that means about a, having a culture be too humo- homogenous. I don't know what that means exactly. Well, like. Consider American culture, right, or you in the United States culture. It's really like an amalgamation. It's a, a classic melting pot, as or so they say. Um, you know, do you think there's value in you know having that diversity around and having such exposure to other cultures, um, or do you think you know the, the cultures having them be separate allows them to foster by themselves? Have you given any thought to this? Well, okay. cultural appropriation is not about separating, first of all. Mm-hmm. It's not about separating. And, and I, I, you know, there are lots of people who would take issue with the melting pot theme because what people haven't done is melted into positions of power and who's making decisions about things. I mean, I would, I would say probably, you know, how diverse is your staff there at Dr. Phil's show? How diverse is that staff? Yeah. So we can be in a melting pot, but the melting pot, you know, you can still have your individual flavors. So this is not about separation. This is about respecting people for who they are and what they bring and not stealing from them. Because that's what the issue is. The issue is taking credit for something that you didn't create. So I've never said that the people should be siloed or separated. So cultural appropriation is not about separating people. It's about giving credit for the stuff that you've stolen that you're taking credit for, whether it's Betty Boop, for example. But you have to also know your history, though, because once you know the history, then you understand Betty Boop was not a white woman. She was a black woman during the jazz age. And this white woman saw this black woman performing and decided to steal that. And what we know is Betty Boop is a white woman. That's different than separating. That is consciously stealing something and getting credit for it. And I gave you the example of Jack Daniels. That is conscious. That is stealing. The enslaved person never got credit for the formula that he created and that made the Jack, Fan- Jack Daniels family uh, you know, very wealthy. So that is different from separating cultures. Yeah. Um, and uh, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to talk about Halloween because, you know, throughout your research and some of the videos that we collected, that seems to be a topic of discussions, especially around this subject. You know, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, some of the Halloween costumes that uh, are culturally appropriated? Yeah. Prison, prison costumes are popular. Taking, you know, somebody's circumstance and somehow making that a costume. And what I mean by a costume is there's no understanding. There's no significance. You know, we've got the sexy prisoner. Uh, we always have sexy nuns. Uh, we, we dress up as sexy priest. Um, you know, if you're going to do something 60s, you have to get an Afro. And I can't tell you how many white people I've seen with uh, Afros who are not Jewish or who are not people whose hair is naturally Afroed. Um, they're old people. I've got costumes of young people dressing up as old people. So you have to have thick glasses and gray hair and you got to have a walker and you got to have a cane. Um, I also see that relative to uh, geisha cons, uh, costume. So you're going to dress up like, a, you know, an Asian woman with an, a wig on. You know, Katy Perry is notorious for this. Um, I, I think of Harajuku and, and uh, Gwen Stefani. And she talked about having these young Japanese women as sort of props for her. And you can see costumes of those. So, you know, I, I, when, I, when I'm talking about Halloween costumes, 
I'm talking about the possibility of being more creative. And, and here's the other thing. I'm not, I'm not saying, for example, that a little um, white child can't be um, Princess Jasmine. What I'm saying is don't put on blackface in order to be Princess Jasmine. Or I see costumes of Col uh, uh, Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick, where he's got an afro, he's on his knees, and he's in blackface. So that's what I'm saying is that's when it crosses the line. That can't be unintentional. Nobody accidentally puts on blackface. Nobody accidentally goes to get an Afro wig. So the costumes run the gamut. But the ones that I've been most interested in are the ones that show age because we often don't think about how much we imitate. And Saturday Night Live is notorious for, you know, imitating old people. And not all people have canes and not all people wear glasses and not all people have walkers. And they don't hobble and they're not all hunched over. So I'm saying, you know, that that's an inhumanity and that's a stereotype. And any time that we sort of fall into stereotypes, then we are denying people their humanity. And that becomes another part of injustice. Yeah. Do you, do you think these costumes and, you know, Saturday Night Live and things like that, you know, teach younger people it's okay to appropriate culture? Yeah. Yeah. Dashikis, for example. You know, I also have issues with, um, you know, I have African attire and, you know, it feels costumey to me to wear that. So I don't. But I see people dressing up like that a lot who have no real understanding of Africa. They just see it as a costume. I'm remembering a, a character in a play that I teach called A Raisin in the Sun. There's a character, Benita, who has a suitor who is from Africa. His name is Asegai. And she's decided that she wants to learn more about Africa. And then she cuts off her straightened hair and has an afro and wears a daishiki. And part of what that play for me signals is that Black people can perform these things also. So please don't take away from this that I said that appropriation can only be white people taken from black people, because I would never say that, because black people can appropriate too, and do appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, has Halloween in some way or another you know, contributed to mass appropriation yes. in other forms of media? You talked yes. a little bit about Saturday Night Live, but is, is there any other... Well, music, music, music is about cultural appropriation, too. I mean, we see that in corporate America when they're using hip hop to sell hot dogs or well, hamburgers or furniture. Um, I saw the other day there was a hip hop, you know, for Stanley Steamer uh, rug cleaning. Um, I see hip hop for uh, hip hop is one of those that has been most appropriated when it comes to language. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that the appropriation is also this form. It's like black voices in the case of race in white spaces. So none of those commercials have black people in them but they use black music or in one case uh, i'm remembering a buffet from a restaurant where it was a you know middle class white family mother father and two children they're at a salad bar and the the white woman mother starts rapping because they've got all these different items on a salad bar and that's cool so commercials uh television uh there are all kinds of instances of that and that's not that's th 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 those are not hard to find. You just need to listen. In fact, I, I'm overwhelmed because there's so many examples that I use in presentations that I do on cultural appropriation. Yeah, you know, what if any does Halloween show us about you know the certain stereotypes and the marginalized marginalization in this country? Oh, that it that it's a holiday where anything goes and you can dismiss it. Uh, and you can try on a costume and then you leave it at the end of that party and then go on about the rest of your life. Whereas those who have to live in those positions and those situations don't get that luxury. And I say that about, you know, having, and I'll say this in the case of white women who decide they want to have braids or cornrows or dreadlocks. Um, they can put that on, but they can also shave that off and not be associated with uh, any uh, discrimination against them. Whereas black people can't take off black skin and not be discriminated against. 
So that's what we talk about privilege. So there are ways in which a conversation about cultural appropriation has also to be about privilege and privilege does exist. And we all have privilege at the same time we don't. So it's both white privilege, it's male privilege, it's class privilege. You know, we make fun of, of uh, poor people, people who don't have enough money. We make, you know, poverty porn becomes a way of exploiting people who are poor. And we have costumes at one point. I don't know if there's a costume of a hobo, but I've seen and I'm putting that in quotation marks, but I've seen, you know, costumes of 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 quote unquote slaves. In fact, after that movie, 12 Years a Slave, one of the department stores had a costume that you could dress up as a slave. And trust me, that is something that is highly consequential for people who are culturally aware. So Halloween is just a, Halloween is just a, oh, here's your past to do something really outrageous. And then when it's over, you can go back to your regular whatever it is you're doing. But there's no understanding. There's no compensation. And it really just perpetuates stereotypes and, and others people. That's what cultural appropriation also does is it others people and and shows the distance between you and them. I think you need to give me a clearer context. <laughs> Is this a black woman who's saying this? Because you didn't say that. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, you didn't say that. You just said it was a woman who says it. Yeah, it, it's one of our guests. She, right. She's a, a black woman, and, and uh, you know, she made a video online kind of talking a little bit about this, and, and her take is that, you know, cultural appropriation isn't um, as big a deal as some people say. So she would be kind of on the other side of the right. argument. So this well, question I is kind of more directed to her. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't really know how she can speak. I, don't, I guess I don't understand how she can speak for how, what kind of big a deal it is for other people. Because um, we, can, we can certainly talk about historical patterns. And the thing about what, at least the perspective I come from, is that this is not about whether you're personally offending people or whether or not it personally bothers you. Because when we're talking about discrimination and oppression, it's bigger than people's personal responses to it. So that, that, that's, I mean, that's not surprising. There are people who disagree about the use of the N-word. Uh, but I'm saying, you know, I also know, I, I got the name of your guest, of the other guest there, and she does a lot of conservative stuff, so. Yeah, yeah. I think so I wouldn't be surprised by that. I, I just don't know where a conversation goes if you're, if, if, because what, what I like to ground mine in is this notion of histories and the ways in which history shows us patterns of how people are treated. So I, I know how I know a little bit of the history. I don't know all of the history. You know, I'm not personally offended when I see somebody culturally appropriating. I just start sort of wondering, do you know what you're doing? And if you knew, would right. you continue to do that? So that to me and, that, and that's what I did say to Joelle. And I, I'm not really there to debate uh, or to try to convince anybody of anything, but just to shed light on what I know and have studied and still yeah, learning. Yeah. And still learning. So, I, I, you know, if that's if that's what she says and that's what she's written, then that's her prerogative to say that. So you won't get an argument from me about trying to convince her. Sure. I mean, the way you just answered it is perfectly fine. And, you know, to your point about it being like you don't want it to be just a black and white yes. um, conversation. Like, you know, the, we're kind of leaving it in your hands to direct the conversation in, mm -hmm. in whatever area you think is most important. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to broaden it and make it more about, like, the history and whatever knowledge, because, I mean, you're, we chose you as an expert for a reason. Like, please impart any knowledge mm -hmm. on the show to me, to, to anyone about what I love how you're doing that already. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, don't think we're trying to, like, pigeonhole you. Into <laughs> well, what, what I'm saying, like, like the history, for example, if the person says she doesn't like braids, she happens to have braids. So I have locks and part of part of this is to understand the history 
And, and we're still having that now in the Crown Act. And I you know California was one of the first states to pass the Crown Act. We still discriminate against people based on hair. And many of the states still don't have anything that protects people from hair discrimination. So why would you have to have a law that says how you can wear your hair? So when a white person decides to have locks or cornrows or dreadlocks, they are moving into a space that is a privileged space because they don't have to have that. There's nothing about their texture or their chosen style that necessarily uh, means that they can avoid the kinds of historical discrimination that black people have had and I personally have had um, as a result of hair that I have. Now I could choose to have different hair or a different hairstyle but it's still part of my ethnic racial identity this hairstyle and the hairstyle is 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 um Yes, it's certainly up to individuals, but but there we've got evidence after evidence, court case after court case, where black women in particular and black men have been denied opportunities because of their hair. You know, India Ari sings about that when she says, I'm not my hair. And then the the male guy whose name I can't remember now comes in and says, yeah, corporate wouldn't hire me because I had dreadlocks. You know, I've had people who look at me and said, oh, you can tell you're not a you're not in corporate America. You must be a musician. So there go the stereotypes again or an artist. Well, I'm neither of those. I'm an educator. But but stereotypes play out, caricatures play out, and these costumes just underscore the ways in which these these get perpetuated. So mine is less about an opinion, but about the ways in which what I bring to the table is is an analysis and what I hope is a thoughtfulness that involves not only trying to impart what I've learned and written about and lectured about, but also what I continue to learn. And also, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's also about self-reflection. You know, I still have these shirts, but every time I look at them, I cannot forget that this is what has been identified as a Mexican Italian shirt. Now, I haven't given them up yet. But I, you know, I even got permission from the person who educated me on that, and I still can't bring myself to wear it. So, you know, I've got some daishikis that I still can't quite bring myself to wear because they feel like costumes. And I don't think anybody can determine that for somebody else. You have to determine that for yourself. And I say the same thing about humanity. You have to determine the extent to which you have extended humanity and received humanity. Nobody can determine that for us. You know, and should people be constantly aware, like, as you are with these certain, you know, items of clothing and how they are appropriating, or is it best that they just live their lives and try not to, well, you know, harm anybody? I, I like to, well, you, you, you know, you can't do that. You can't choreograph the extent to which you can't harm anybody because accidents happen. I mean, you can have a car accident. You didn't intend to have a car accident. You can't choreograph that. What I think people can do, however, is practice some humanity by demonstrating compassion, respect, uh, a little bit of empathy for things that we don't understand uh, and recognize that we will make mistakes. But it's how you respond to the mistake that determines whether or not that's been um, a, a disservice or an injustice to someone else. And also practicing forgiveness, forgiveness to other people, but also forgiveness to ourselves because we will make mistakes i don't think we need a checklist because that's what people also want to be very reductive they want to say well is this it is this it is this it and i was like okay let's stop that mentality because what you're really trying to do is to reduce the conversation and you're going to find something that's not on the list and say oh does this count does this count and i hope the conversation is bigger than that so that it really becomes how can we respect other people's humanity even if we don't understand it. And once it's pointed out, how do we respond to it? Are we defensive? Are we trying to justify what we're doing? Or are we just willing to sort of stay in our positions and say we don't care about somebody else's humanity? And clearly there are lots of evidence of that, uh, that go beyond cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, speaking to that, like, do you think people attack those culturally appropriating in an inappropriate manner sometimes? You know, again, from this woman we were talking about earlier who's going to be playing on the other side of this argument, mm -hmm. that's a big part of her reasoning why this movement, um, she doesn't agree with it, is she calls it the woke mob. Um, oh, God. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, God. Or, or you <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Oh, God. That is, that is much bigger than this conversation when you start bringing in wokeism. 
uh, that is much bigger and it's too aligned with the stuff I've seen that person talk about critical race theory and the significance of, of talking about histories, which we can't talk about now because it makes white people and conservative black people feel, you know, uh, uncomfortable. That is bigger when you start talking about wokeism. I think that anytime, let's put it in this kind, let's take the word woke out. Let's say that it's about education and learning about our histories. And once you know the history, you can't unknow that. So I'm saying, for example, if we studied our histories and we know, for example, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was not intended for all people, that is not an interpretation. That is historical fact. And the people who were writing those did not look like me and they didn't look like her. And when they talked about all men being created equal, they talked about all white men and white men who were financially stable and white men who were heterosexual and white men who had, you know, were uh, cisgender. So this notion that we can somehow attack people for knowing our history and the truth of our history and not just subscribing to a quote unquote master narrative is what is dismissed as wokeism. It's not wokeism. It's about learning and understanding and doing better once that you know better. It's too easy. It's sort of like dismissing people with who talk about political correctness. P political correctness is about acknowledging people's humanity, not about political correctness. But that's been and I, ho I, I sincerely hope that the conversation doesn't um, devolve into a conversation about wokeism, because that would be very disappointing. Yeah. Because there's nothing to say. There's nothing to, if you disagree with something, you disagree with it. And that's why I, I don't want this to be a debate. There's nothing to debate if that's what her belief is. But I would like some evidence, though. I'd like some receipts that you can bring to the table and not just people's opinions, because everybody has an opinion. But do you have anything to support that opinion? Yeah, you, you know, and speaking kind of to to some of these you know misconceptions that are going around. Do you, do you can you point to any like other common mistakes people drum up when they sort of discuss cultural appropriation as a serious issue or try to negate the importance of this topic in society? Um. Well, that's an interesting question to be asking now when, you know, so many of the states don't want uh, classrooms, public uh, classroom teachers to talk about history. You know, the, the problem with that is that we can't talk about Juneteenth without talking about U.S. history and race relations and slavery. And so it's a really odd moment uh, to have this conversation, particularly, you know, we're, we're, what, two years off of George Floyd, where there was this moment where people were really, really uh, aware and trying to read and trying to watch and trying to do better. And now we've done a total flip flop so that we can't even talk about that now. So it's an interesting moment to be talking about that. Uh, so I, I guess I don't know you know, kind of where we are relative to um, where discussion about cultural appropriation fits in this, except to say that cultural appropriation, and I said this at the beginning, is about power and history. And if you don't know your history or know the histories, then it is easy to be dismissive and say that's just the people who are woke. But I like to think that people who are waking up is that you wake up from a slumber because you're unaware. But once you become aware of something, the awareness doesn't make you happier. So I hope that 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 people get that. Once you start seeing it, you can't unsee it. And you start seeing systemic racism everywhere. And you and if it weren't there, you wouldn't see it. You're not creating it. When I gave you the example of 80% of the power in this country rest in the hands of white people, that is data. That's not an opinion. So that's what I'm saying. That's systemic. It's everywhere. It's not coincidental that we don't have very many black uh, late night uh, TV hosts. Why is that? It's not coincidental that 80% of the people who are teaching in public schools are white women. Why is that? That's not opinion. We can look at that in terms of data. So for me, is once you bother to take time to sort of uncover and to sort of acknowledge our own vulnerabilities that we stand to learn something, then we're not dismissive of people by talking about wokeism. Because it's too easy to throw that in the same bucket, just like we've done with critical race theory. Nobody is teaching critical race theory in K through 12. We know that. 
that's taught in law schools. But yet we can throw that in a bucket for any conservative politically who wants to say we don't want to talk about race. And that's where the stuff after George Floyd became a conversation about anti-racism. And now we don't want to talk about anything that has to do with race, even though technically, if you're talking about U.S. history, you're talking about race. Right. And you're talking about gender. Yes. So all of those, that's why I don't know. I don't even, you know, I don't even subscribe to this notion of woke. Yeah. So or political correctness. Yeah, yeah. Those to me are dismissive terms when people don't have anything critically sound or substantive to say. You just dismiss it. Well, I know what I'm talking about, and I'm, I'm not offering these as opinions. I'm not offering these as opinions. This is somebody who has studied and who continues to study. So, you know, I, I don't, you know, embrace that expert uh, with any kind of boastfulness because I'm still learning about this. But I do know that's why I'm reluctant to participate in a debate because a debate is about winning and losing. A debate is not about a conversation. And I'm not here or I don't want to be there to try to convince anybody of anything. I don't even try to convince my students. What I say is, here's what I have to offer you. It's a buffet. You can choose what you want. And the hope is that you'll see something differently after we've had our conversation than when you came into the conversation. That's all I can do. Yeah. Yeah, and that's all we're going to ask you to do. I, I mean, I just, I, I don't think they're going to, like this other person that we're talking about, I don't mm -hmm. Like, there's no way we can control them. Mm -hmm. They might want to debate, but I, I really hope that, you know, I, I know that you're not going to, but, like, there's no need for you to engage. Like, uh, really, you could just you drop the, the knowledge, you know, and just let, kind of let her and the rest of the audience fester and, and mm -hmm. do it. Well, and I, I also yeah, have I, love how you put that. I also have to be very mindful, too, because this is a woman uh, that I'm not mansplaining. Because, you know, when you're self-reflective, you need to be aware of all those things. But I, I would hope that Dr. Phil, as the moderator, would step in when it feels like it's becoming a debate that's going nowhere. Because debates are for yeah. audiences yeah. to determine who wins. And a conversation in humanity is not about winning. That's about capitalism. Yeah. It's not about conversation. It's not collaboration. And it's not about community. And I'm all about community and collaboration. We can disagree on things, but it's not about winning. We reward just we yeah. reward people for winning. We don't reward people for being in conversation and collaboration with each other. Yeah, totally. You know, I, I just have like one last question here. Sure. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, uh, I guess it's kind of the, the crux of this whole thing. You know, how do you and you know what are some ways that you've learned are useful in reshaping our culture to one that is more culturally conscious? You know. How can we avoid these mistakes and mm -hmm. show people the right from wrong um, going forward? Well, let's extend people grace uh, and let's recognize that we're all vulnerable and we can have things to, we can, we, we, until we are dead, we should still be learning and lifelong learners. But we also have to have the desire to be vulnerable enough to say our minds can be changed and that the more we read and the more we learn and the more we engage with people, the more likely we are to expand our own horizons. So I also want to be mindful of the fact that, you know, sometimes you can read stuff that just underscores what you already believe instead of stepping into spaces where you're vulnerable and learning from other people. So one of the reasons I like being in the classroom is because it's not so much that I teach students, but I learn from the students. And so for me, it feels that if we if we really want to try to be you know united as a people, uh, and I have questions about whether that's true or not, but we have to acknowledge mm -hmm. that there's lots of stuff we still have yet to learn and be open to the possibility that we could be wrong. And not feel that that's a frailty, but rather a human strength when we can acknowledge that and that we can evolve. That's why I you know, resist notions about you know, somebody being racist or somebody being X, Y, and Z. That's an end of a punctuation versus whether people's behaviors can change. And that's what I am hopeful that people's behaviors, including my own and our thinking, can in fact change. All right. Well, that's all I had prepared for you, Neil. I so enjoyed this conversation. I, I think you're going to be an excellent guest. Um, Thank you. I yeah. I, I think I'm going to inquire when I I'm going to probably be there on the taping of the show. I would okay. love to learn. You know, get some reading suggestions. Whenever I talk to like a really knowledgeable guest 
on this show, I always try to ask, like, is there some books I can read to kind of get this wisdom, you know? <laughs> well, keep, keep in mind, keep in mind, wisdom and, and knowledge doesn't come from a single source. And, you know, I said this right after George Floyd's murder and people were frantically coming up with racial justice statements and they were frantically coming up with, oh, what book should I be reading and what podcast should I be? I said, well, that's certainly good. But if you don't engage in conversation with people, then you're just left with whatever you came with, with a book. That's what's exciting to me about a classroom and community conversations is that you reach out and see that people are doing these organizations are doing these and the more we learn the better we are and we become more aware but learning doesn't make you happier though because you start seeing stuff that you didn't see before and you start seeing it everywhere the issue is how do you then respond to that so uh, yeah I, there, there are lots of stuff you know I, I i try to do this and that's one of the responses i gave to Maisie yesterday you know why do i want to be on the show well the show called me and invited me to be on the show I didn't call the show, so they must see something in the expertise that I bring. But for me, I think it allows me to talk to a different audience and to show that what we do as scholars and educators doesn't have to be restricted to a classroom on a campus. So for me, the, I, the, the ability to talk to different audiences, particularly this audience, I've had many non-classroom audiences. I've been on news cast and YouTubes and as I said Good Morning America and and you know had my stuff in USA Today so I'm not I'm not chasing those things but when I have an opportunity to talk to people who are not in my classroom then I consider that a plus so I'm happy to share whatever I have but that's why I do interviews and I write about it and I teach about it and I do workshops and I'd love to be invited to Dr. Phil to do one of these workshops with your people there okay all right. Yeah, thank you so much. Neil. You're very welcome. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good one.